Okay guys, let's take a look at our next problem and see what it entails. So it says in this problem that a solid insulating sphere of radius A equals to 10 centimeters carries a net positive charge of 5.0 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs uniformly distributed throughout its volume. Concentric with this sphere is an uncharged conducting spherical shell with an inner radius of 20 centimeters and an outer radius of 25 centimeters. And they're asking us to find the electric fields at some radius less than A, a radius between A and B, some radius between B and C, and then finally um, a radius greater than, well it should say C, so I'm guessing there's a typo there, so a radius greater than C. Um, <clears throat> so in this guys is about as interesting as a or a comprehensive as a problem is going to get for this chapter um, in my opinion it might be a little bit too long for it to be a midterm uh, problem but it might show up on your final um, regardless this is a great problem it encapsulates a lot of the major concepts that you know this chapter on Gauss's law has to teach you um, so let's get to it so the very first thing um, that we need to understand upon reading the problem is that it's asking us to find the electric field somewhere inside here, somewhere in between here, somewhere in between these guys, and then outside over here somewhere. Furthermore, we should know that this is an insulator and this is a conductor, and therefore the properties of these substances should come to mind. For example, for an insulator, you know, the charge is everywhere distributed throughout its volume, but for a conductor, we should know that the charge resides um, only on the surface. And at the moment, it is telling us that the conductor is uncharged, so we do not place any charge on it. So let's take a look at the first part of the problem. It's arguably one of the, is arguably the hardest part of this problem. It is asking us to find the electric field at some radius less than A. So the diagram associated with that guy will be this. We're somewhere inside of this insulated sphere. So let's blow this up a little bit. Uh, we know that it also carries a charge, Q, equals to um, 5 microcoulombs. And we know that the inner radius A is equal to 0 0.1 meters or 10 centimeters. Now, if we want to calculate the electric field somewhere inside here, um, we should understand that we're going to be applying Gauss's law to get the job done. We cannot use other formulas that we are accustomed to. For example, Coulomb's law or the electric field as KQ um, over R squared cannot be applied because this formula exists um, for point charges only. And in this volume, we have this many coulombs, we have an infinite number of charges that reside inside over here. So to tackle this problem, there's only two options really. Either you're going to have to integrate or you're going to apply Gauss's law. Now since it's a nice and symmetric shape, Gauss's law is the move. What we're going to do Oh, that might not be enough. Let's try that again. Let's make it a little bit more transparent than what it currently is. Perhaps that'll get the job done. So the first step in Gauss's law is to um, create a Gaussian surface at the point you are interested in. So that's what we're going to start by doing. We're going to create a Gaussian surface. Now remember that for us, a Gaussian surface essentially is always going to be a cylinder unless your problem contains a sphere. In which case, we're going to use a sphere for our Gaussian surface. So our Gaussian surface is going to be a sphere of some radius r, and it is understood that r is less than a. So this is our Gaussian surface. OK, so now that we've started the problem off, we're going to apply Gauss's law, which essentially is the integral of E dot dA, the flux, in other words, is equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. 
Now we spoke about this um, in our last class. We know for the purposes of this course, this formula um, will pretty much always boil down to E times the area of your Gaussian surface equals to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. So you can review your notes to see how to go from here to here. Essentially, it's because the electric field and the area vector are parallel to each other. So in applying this, understand that we're trying to solve for the electric field. So that means every other ingredient must be known. So we know the area, right? The area of our Gaussian surface. That's not going to be too difficult to calculate. So our area is going to be um, the area of a sphere, which is 4 pi r squared. It's going to equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught. Now, epsilon naught is just a constant, so we know that guy. Now, the problem is we do not know what q enclosed here is. So we have to put on our thinking caps a little bit. So the question q enclosed, essentially, pretend that the original sphere contains water. It's filled with water. Now, within that sphere, you put in another sphere, your Gaussian sphere. And the question is, how much water does your sphere contain? And in order to answer a question like this, we have to use the concept of charge densities. We learned, again, earlier on with our previous problems that there are three of these, right? There's lambda, or line charge density, sigma, or surface charge density, and finally, rho, or volume charge density. Since we are talking about volumes over here, we are going to use the volume charge density, multiply it by the volume that we are interested in, and that is going to give us the charge enclosed. The problem here is that we don't, don't have rho. We don't have the volume charge density. So we're going to have to go and fetch that first. Remember that the charge density can be calculated as the total charge divided by the total volume. So if we apply that to our scenario, we're going to realize that the total charge, first of all, is 5 times 10 to the negative 6. And it's distributed over the total volume. So the volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi r cubed, and r being a 0.1 cubed. Calculating this is going to give us rho. So let's get that done. So if I've done this correctly in my calculator, I get a value of 1.194 times 10 to the negative 3. And this is going to be coulombs per meter cubed. So that is the value we're going to take, plug in over here, multiply it by the volume, and then we should have pretty much everything we need in order to calculate the electric field. So continuing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to write the rho, replace rho by 1.194 times 10 to the negative 3. The volume, this time it's going to be our volume, the volume we are interested in which is 4 over 3 pi, now our radius, so r cubed. And we're going to divide this by, I'm going to take this guy and put it down here, so 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. And we can start simplifying things a little bit. We can see that some of these r's go away. Two of these can cancel with two of those, leaving us with just one r. Furthermore, there's a pi on the bottom and a pi on top. There's a 4 on the bottom and a 4 on top. And so with whatever remains, we can quickly calculate our electric field. So our electric field is going to be this guy divided by 3, and then divided by epsilon naught. Now remember, epsilon naught is 8.854 to the power of negative 12. It's a constant that will be supplied to you on any exam. So calculating this, we finally end up with 4.494 times 10 to the power of 367. And then that r doesn't go away, it stays around. And 
The units for the electric field are either volts per meter or newtons per coulomb. And finally, electric field is a vector, so you have to let us know the direction, and we can we know that the direction of this positively charged sphere is going to be radially outwards, so you can write radially outwards, or let us know that this is going to be in the r hat direction. And so that'll be the answer to the first part of this problem, and this is going to allow us to proceed to the second one. So let's take a look at the second piece. This time around, we are somewhere in between this insulated sphere and the conductor. So in this white region over here, so the diagram associated with that one is simply going to be this. Now this is a much easier scenario since we are interested in what is happening right outside over here. Once again, we're going to start off by creating our Gaussian surface, which again is going to be a sphere. So there it is. So there's our Gaussian sphere or Gaussian surface and we want to know what the electric field is somewhere let's say over here at some radius r which is of course between a and b. Applying the exact same formula Ea equals q enclosed over epsilon naught. Now remember guys on an exam it's probably a good idea not to jump here but to show the steps that we've seen earlier to get here properly. And if we just start plugging things in, this one gets the job done fairly easily. So this area is the area of your Gaussian sphere. So once again, 4 pi r squared. And here we know what Q enclosed is. We don't need to do this business about calculating the volume charge density because if we ask ourselves how much charge is enclosed in this Gaussian surface, well, the answer is all of it. All five microcoulombs are within our sphere. And so here it's going to be um, 5 times 10 to the negative 6 divided by epsilon naught or 8.854 times 10 to the negative 12. Doing the math over here, it's not going to take us long to figure out what our electric field is going to be. So if I go 5 um, exponent negative 6 divided by 8.854 exponent negative 12, and then I bring this term down as well. So divide this number by 4 pi. I will get 4493 8.7 divided by r squared. And once again, this is going to be radially outward. And once again, it's in newtons per coulomb. And so this, whoops, let's try that again. Um, and so this is the answer to part B, um, and it's fairly straightforward. The next region is somewhere inside of this conductor. And so um, this part is going to teach us something, okay? We said earlier that if you have a conductor, the charge resides on the conductor, and most of us already know that if you lie inside of the conductor, the electric field for sure is zero. So we know this, we've learned this, we know we are located over here, we know that the electric field should be equal to zero because we are inside of a conductor, and this is a property of conductors. However, let's just take a look at what Gauss's law would have given us. So had we applied Gauss's law over here, creating a Gaussian surface somewhere inside of this conductor, and calculating the electric field using Gauss's law, let's see what we end up with. So Gauss's law says that E times A is equal to Q enclosed over epsilon naught. And if we apply this, what we would end up with is E times our area 4 pi r squared, where r is between b and c, is equal to q enclosed over epsilon naught. Now let's discuss what q enclosed is. If I was to ask you over here how much of this charge is contained within this Gaussian surface, well, according to this diagram, it seems like all of this charge is contained over there. So once again, it is for sure 5 times 10 to the negative 6. Now, over here, if we continue solving this problem, you should realize that we're going to obtain a value for E, 
it is not going to be equal to zero. So obviously there is some disconnect over here. There's a piece of information that we are missing somewhere. So let's talk about that. So it turns out that what we need to understand over here is that a conductor has this property that all of its charges reside on the surface. But not only that, there is an intrinsic property of metals or conductors in, and that is that they, if they can, they try to always keep the electric field equal to zero. And the way they do it is they intrinsically take a look at how much charge they have inside over here. In our case, five microcoulombs. And this conductor is automatically going to deposit the exact same magnitude of charge, but opposite in sign in its inner surface. So along this inner surface, the conductor will intrinsically put a negative five microcoulomb charge deposited there. It's just going to automatically do this. And since the conductor is supposed to be uncharged, it's also going to put positive five microcoulombs in its outer surface and thereby maintaining its neutral or uncharged property. Now, if, it was, if there were 10 coulombs of charge or 10 microcoulombs of charge deposited on the conductor, the conductor would automatically take negative five, put it there and automatically take 15 and put it there, thereby to maintain that 10 microcoulomb overall charge. So that is something we need to understand that the conductor automatically does this, even though it's uncharged, is going to deposit the exact opposite of this number right there. And therefore you can say that the total charge inside of my conductor is in fact zero. And now both these theories make sense. So this is a very important thing to understand here. This enhances our theory of how conductors work and Gauss's law. And it's because of things like this that this course is a little bit difficult. We have to really understand the theor theoretical part of the class. And lastly, guys, we fall under a very simple scenario. And this is where R is greater than C, not D. And so now we're outside of everything over here. So creating our Gaussian surface, we're going to see this guy. So we want to know what the electric field is over here. And no matter which way you look at it, uh, you know, you're, you're going to get to the same answer. So once again, E times our area for pi R squared is equal to Q enclosed. Now this time around, if you say, ask yourself how much Q is enclosed here, well, there's five microcoulombs here, there's minus five here, and there's positive five here for a grand total of five microcoulombs. So the Q enclosed is five times 10 to the negative six. Again, over epsilon naught, 8.854 times 10 to the negative 12. Um, if you stare at this, you're going to see that you've kind of already done this calculation right up here. So the values are going to be, or the magnitude of the electric field is going to be the same. Just understand here, R is between um, A and B, and now here R will be much larger. But our answer, guys, is going to be the exact same as this one, so let's go, let's go fetch it. So it's going to come out to the same exact expression as it did in part B. So hopefully that was helpful, guys. Like I said, this is a nice comprehensive problem from this chapter, and hopefully it taught you guys something. Let's move on to the next problem.